test whatever audio you have coming out of here. Thank you. I kept adjusting this, so. Everybody here? Should we turn that off? Yeah. Is there a quiet is there a quieter fan? about the wait, we're locked and loaded now, ready to go. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, this is the, the, the first of uh, three uh, discussions today, and there's three more tomorrow. Uh, each of them is, is somewhat unique in its format and style, I think we're interested in uh, just kind of an ongoing uh, exploration of different ways that we can uh, uh, talk about art uh, in, in, a, in a more interesting way. Um, as part of this series, we like serving waffles. We like kind of cutting some of the, uh, the, the formality with some delicious uh, food. So help yourselves. Um, I'm Ron Berry, the artistic director of Fusebox. Uh, and I am sitting here with the, the lovely and talented and brilliant Wayne Ashley, who's also a, a championship caliber uh, waffle eater. He'll be demonstrating his skills afterwards. Um, so the first session, we're going to be talking about uh, this new art and technology platform uh, that Fusebox is embarking on in collaboration with Future Perfect, um, which is uh, an organization that Wayne founded and runs. And he, he'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments. Um, we're going to um, walk you through some of the, 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 the bigger ideas uh, that we're thinking about with regards to art and technology and why we're interested in articulating and creating this specific platform. Um, we're going to also show you some work uh, that's living in this kind of uh, intersection just to kind of help give you some context and uh, ignite some thinking around this. Um, and then we're going to kind of briefly go through some of the talking points and goals as we're uh, thinking about them currently with uh, regards to this new art and technology platform. And then we're going to open it up for questions uh, and love to hear, hear from you all. Um, so uh, I'm going to start and tell you just a little bit about the festival and why we're thinking about this platform. Uh, Fusebox from, I think, a, little, a, a macro view um, is, is uh, really a, a platform for conversation and ideas. We champion innovative, uh, adventurous works of art across uh, every artistic discipline. And we're really interested in creating a vital conversation between different uh, mediums. Uh, this is uh, central to my 
uh, understanding of uh, creativity, this notion of uh, hybridity. Um, sometimes uh, when I think of hybridity, that means uh, interesting marriage, and sometimes it means, uh, I think, uh, more of a collision of ideas. Um, but this is something that I'm really interested in and that the festival is, is really interested in. Um, we also, uh, from a macro view, uh, view the festival as a, as a mechanism for engaging with the world. Um, and I feel like if this is a mechanism for engaging with the world, we have to be dealing with technology and talking about technology. Um, the, uh, I think in many ways, we're less interested in the latest gadgetry, but we're really interested in our relationship culturally with technology because everyone is sort of dancing with it right now, whether we like it or not. We're really interested in the ubiquitous nature of technology um, and kind of shining a light on that. Uh, I think another thing that, we, uh, that we're interested in uh, constantly exploring as a festival is different ways that we can interact with and engage with the city, with this place that we're living in. And the technology sector is a really huge, uh, vibrant part of this community. And so we also saw this platform as a really exciting sort of lever to uh, engage with that community as well. Um, and then we're also just always looking for ways to create um, uh, partnerships or collaborations that would not exist. Future Perfect and Fusebox have just been on the first panel. Sorry. Um, Fusebox and Future Perfect, we have the same continent, so that's also very exciting. It's almost like they were made to go together, so. And we like each other, and that's also very important. We have the free will. Yeah. We're not fooled by any of that. So we were really um, interested in with someone that was um, actually not from Austin. Uh, we felt like we have the ability to engage with the larger Austin community and can build par partnerships in this arena here. We had less expertise and awareness of this arena nationally and internationally, and I think we were looking for someone that could really help us uh, make some of those connections. We were looking for someone that has a great deal of experience working at this intersection. Um, and all of these things, uh, Future Perfect and Wayne, uh, really, uh, this, this describes them perfectly. And also, we've just been really <coughs> impressed with the work that Wayne uh, has done. He has, he's, has a remarkable body of work um, that's really, uh, he's really presenting and commissioning and uh, helping to produce some of the most exciting uh, projects uh, that are living in this, in this arena. So, um, and like you said, we really like each other. So um, that's sort of how this began um, from our side. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass so it over. Fr from, from my side, you know, so Future Perfect is now three years old. Um, we're a nomadic um, uh, organization, which is um, exciting in one way in that we're not uh, bound to a particular venue. We're not bound to a particular geographical location which gives us an immense malleability to produce and work in lots of different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a festival or a recurring season, and so uh, the ability to actually position some of this work in a, in a festival context is very exciting because it, it frames the work in very different kinds of ways. And also, from my perspective, um, and. All of our work depends on partnerships. We cannot exist without partnerships. Um, uh, and it, it, the way the economics are going in terms of cultural production, um, partnering is going to be critical to um, being able to put together large scale kinds of events and doing very, very um, um, complex and provocative work. You're going to need two, three, four kinds of partners. And I'm also excited about, I've done work in Europe, but I have done less within my own country. I'm very excited about the possibility of working with a different city um, that has a different kind of artistic, social, and economic sensibility. 
Uh, and, I, and I'm interested to see what kinds of work emerges out of that kind of inter-institutional relationship that we're going to forge, as well as what can you and I do to activate our own individual networks mm -hmm. to create a kind of regional collaboration, which is a much larger vision, but that excites me to no end, to see Absolutely. what our larger region, uh, are the regional pockets of activity that we can activate um, beyond just our two institutions. Wonderful. Uh, do you want to? Um, let's see. So, we so let me. Just, so let me just yeah. say a little bit about what Future Perfect does, and Wonderful. then go into Wonderful. some of the examples. Yep. Great. Um, so I'm the founding artistic director of Future Perfect, which is a performance media, visual art, and technology platform. I started that three years ago. Um, before that, I was the director of art and technology at an organization called Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Before that, I was the Director of Art and Technology at BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is one of the larger um, venues for experimental performance, dance, symphony, et cetera. And then before that, I was the Program Director of an organization called um, Open Studio, which is a national initiative uh, started by the Benton Foundation, National Endowment of the Arts, in eight separate cities throughout the country to teach and mentor um, artists, cultural institutions, uh, underserved populations, how to think about the internet. And that was in 1996. Uh, and so I directed that program. So I have about 15 years experience in this arena. Um, I think Future Perfect and Fusebox has a lot of overlapping goals in this area. Our primary mission is to offer commissions, residencies, production support, as well as presentation opportunities to artists and researchers who are either ongoingly rethinking, reconstituting their artistic practice in relationship to what sometimes is referred to as the increasing technologicalization of everyday life. <laughs> How do we live in an environment that is increasingly being technologicalized? And what kind of art and cultural experiences do we make in that context? Um, and as Rhonda already mentioned, it's the ordinariness now. It's the ubiquity. The technologies are no longer new. And it's this ordinariness, I think, that's going to provide the most interesting aesthetic, political, and economic challenges and artistic challenges for both artists and audiences alike. So I want to emphasize that um, this is not the new, this is kind of the everyday that we're investigating. Um, the most common understanding of art and technology is about the computer and computational as the platform for making art. And both Ron and I uh, agree that this is not solely what we want to focus on. There are lots of other kinds of technologies, including electromechanical technologies, the electromagnetic spectrum, robotics, new forms of acoustics, sonics, display technologies, 3D graphical worlds, um, gaming technology, mobile technology, um, new forms of architectural materials. All of these kinds of things now are readily accessible to both people in their everyday lives and to artists who are interested in um, playing with these materials. I also want to say that um, we are not, and I, we both are in agreement with this, that we are not interested in the new, never before experienced forms of culture. You know, we're also interested in how these technologies interact with art forms that have long chains of continuity, not just the new, but things like opera and ballet and theater and symphony, what kinds of transformations are these technologies going to make in those forms that you know, are, are, have centuries of traditions? So we're interested both in the new, but we're also interested in kind of these hybrid um, new constellations of old technology interacting with new technology. And finally, um, we're very much interested in a kind of scale and continuum of places, spaces, and venues. So we're interested um, in what art looks like on the web, 
in, in network environments, but all the way through streets, public spaces, clubs, theater spaces, symphony spaces, opera houses, and then huge spectacle 360 degree planetarium. So we're really interested in the tiniest opportunities to um, explore in a kind of microwave all the way to large um, scale um, experiences. So with that, yeah, Ron, any comments on that? No, no, I think that's exactly, and that's something that we've always really been interested in as a festival, um, creating a whole host of, of different uh, s differently scaled experiences. We really like this idea that we can program events for one or two people, um, but we can also have large public events for thousands of people, and that uh, the festival can, as a uh, mechanism, offer a, a whole host of different windows uh, to experience within to which to experience the art, and a whole host of different interfaces. Um, but I, I, I'm really interested in, in that scale, the in intimate. As, as well as sort of a, a large public scale and everything in that uh, continuum. We're also interested in, um, in not getting locked into fine art as the kind of um, aesthetic overarching set of values. I'm also interested in popular culture, mass culture, and everything in between. Right now, um, for me in Future Perfect, the least amount of boundaries the least constraints, the better right now, because I think we're at a, we're at a place right now where um, we need to experiment full force and not get locked into certain kinds of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in the continuum again of looking at how these transform not only popular culture, but fine art as well and everything in between. So um, I want to talk really quickly about six kind of areas that Ron and I are interested in kind of foregrounding in the next three years because we're in the process of developing a strategic plan um, and, and s s these are some of the areas that I think um, while they're not brand new they're kind of ongoing and artists are, invent are, are invested in, in these particular um, arenas. The first one is immersion. Um, this is Issues of immersion have been going on, you know, for for centuries. Um, so it's not a new idea, but these are artists who are interested in collapsing the perceived distance between the viewer and the artwork, creating a condition of framelessness, um, and being inside the work. So, kind of dissolving all these categories of inside and outside, and really creating work in which you you are inside the image and not looking at it from a distance. Um, the second area is called database aesthetics and visualization. Um, this is the art of organizing, storing, retrieving, and making meaning of large sets of data information. In the last 20 years or more, the prolific amount of information and numbers and statistics that circulate throughout the globe is phenomenal and it grows constantly. And people who are interested in database aesthetics and visualization are interested in finding ways of um, creating meaning out of seemingly random numbers that circulate on the internet, on mobile you know, devices, um, through blogs. Um, how do we make meaning of that and how do we give shape and craft it into something that we can connect to bodily and um, sensually? Uh, the third one is physical computing. This is the art of creating interactive physical systems by the use of software and hardware that can sense and respond to input from the human world. So all the different ways that humans can create gestures, objects, um, um, physical kinds of um, experiences that can be input into the computer, which then produces a whole variety of media outputs, whether it's video, sound, etc. So this relationship of the physical body and the virtual and the computer, that relationship and how we move back and forth between those two spaces is what physical computing seeks to examine. Um, 
hybrid space. Everyone exists in hybrid space. We're existing in hybrid space right now. Um, when you're driving your car, you're in a physical environment, and then you're suddenly, which you're not supposed to do, be talking on a, on a cell phone, which is transporting, in a sense, to a, and connecting to a whole other space in another location, while you have a movie in the back <laughs> on and the radio. We're talking about five different spaces, media spaces, simultaneously existing. And this is magnifying all the time. How do we ex exist in that space? How do we navigate that space? And how do we bring those spaces into juxtaposition with one another, interpenetrate one another, overlap one another for artistic purposes and experiences? Um, Close to the last one is something I called <laughs> computer. <laughs> you can see, <laughs> you can see why this can no, take no, a it's, bit. It's, it's computer awesome. vision. In the computer industry, um, this is a subfield that involves developing methods for acquiring, processing, analyzing, and understanding images. This is about duplicating human vision by electronically perceiving and understanding. That's a mouthful, but it happens in our day all the time. For example, when you're scanned at an airport, this is a process of computer vision. The computer has to be taught how to distinguish clothing from bottles, from potential um, dangerous objects. That's computer vision. Um, when you go through a red light and your license is scanned and it's sent automatically by the internet and you get a ticket, that's computer vision. Um, when you are um, uh, uh, when cameras are set up in, um, in malls or, or environments like that and they're scanning for humans who might be stealing something, <laughs> that computer has to be taught how to distinguish a human from an object or the aisle or any other thing and also to recognize that there are certain kinds of gestures that may quote unquote be codified as stealing. So all those are um, what computer vision does and artists are using that for some very interesting purposes which I'll give you an example later. And finally sound if we have time. Did you want to say anything? No, no, it's okay. awesome. Um, the, so the first example I want to give you is um, about immersion. Um, this is a work that I produced uh, two years ago uh, called Z by Kurt Henschlager. Um, let me quickly um, read a, a paragraph that I wrote for uh, a catalog um, that will kind of describe very succinctly um, what immersion is and what the challenges are. For over a decade, Henschlager has been exploring ways of enhancing and intensifying perception by temporarily removing individuals from their ordinary surroundings and subjecting them to the engulfing effects of stroboscopic lighting and shifting color fields, intense soundscapes, and sub-bass, often amidst enormous multi-screen surround environments or inside of special enclosures built specifically for the work. Henschlager finds ways of collapsing the gap between viewer and work, image and reality, inside and outside. And that's kind of the key thing that I want to remember, that this is a whole group of, uh, of artists and a whole discourse about this desire to lessen, and it's happen it happens in theater as well. I mean, theater is also, at least since the 60s, been very interested in dissolving the proscenium um, framework that allows one to kind of look at a distance. Um, the museum context and the way in which exhibits are framed and paintings are framed, all of this permits, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but it permits a certain kind of reflexivity and a certain kind of distance from the work that these artists are very much interested in inverting and creating the opposite. So this work was called Z. What we did was built an enormous space, as you see, with surround sound, 
filled with solid fog. The fog was so dense that you could not see up or down. This is just beginning to fill the space, but when we fill it, you can see your hand about like this, and as soon as you go like that, it's gone. So there are no spatial cubes. Up, down, left, right, gone. We lead 10 people at a time through a series of chambers till we get to the final chamber, and we open the doors, and it's 12 spotlights, blinding white. So it's, it's the most awesome, terrifying white space you've ever seen in your life. And then we turn off those lights, and we subject them to carefully orchestrated, software-controlled con strobe lights. This is just showing you what the environment looks like when we open the door and, and this water vapor comes out. The funny thing about strobe at certain levels, and the art, what the artist does is manipulate the speed by which this light is um, penetrated into the eyes. The brain wants to make sense, wants to make meaning of that. And when it can't do that, something interesting happens. The brain becomes unstable. And a byproduct of instability is that the whole architecture of the brain reveals itself to itself as a series of the most intense, psychedelic, moving mandalas you've ever experienced unless you've taken drugs. <laughs> this is some of the patterns that you'll see. All of this is taking place in the brain. And so because the fog and the lights are being dispersed, you have no sense of the focal point. So no matter where you turn in the space, you are hallucinating. So the whole piece is 20 minutes, and it all pl takes place in the brain. You can't document it, because people who sneak in there with their iPhones are, are surprised when they come out to see white, black, white, white, <laughs> red, white, black. It's all the dramaturgy. The dramaturgy is taking place in the brain. <laughs> so this was a work which has all kinds of very serious, complicated ramifications, which I won't get into. But um, I'm just going to give you a very quick um, minute of some of the people, because I can't document this, who came out of that experience. Audio? No audio. You had to say something smart about something that's so like purely sensual? It's just light. I know, but all I... The, all the images are what you, like... Create? Yeah. Um, that was the most insane thing I've ever been a part of. At first, it was extremely uncomfortable. I really wanted out. The anxiety was... Almost scary. He opens the first door and it's like, boom. Look, once your visibility starts going, you're kind of like, okay, whoa, what's, what's happening? You don't even know where you are. You lose your sense of space, time, and motion. I mean, I didn't even know I was in there for 20 minutes. I would have guessed like two minutes. It did feel a little bit like death. You know, like, if you don't have a body, is this what your existence is like? You literally lose you your body. Heaven, you like have no body. Like you like can't see your body. Heaven. I've never. I never felt like that, ever. That like happens so purely in your own brain that, that it's impossible to even compare it to anybody else's. Uh, forms are appearing in front of you. Fractals and, and B waves that just moved around in a clockwise direction, in a counterclockwise direction. Different patterns emerging that cross fade into each other that spread out hexagonal stuff, you know, sort of like uh, vegetable cells. And the shapes were so beautiful. So beautiful, and the colors were colors melting into each other, patterns just swirling around each other. Things flying through the air, and faces and like pieces of wood and stuff that like I knew wasn't there. <laughs> Electric crackling around me like lightning sword. Anyway, you get a sense. Um, I don't think I've ever experienced anything that intense, and for a 20 minute work to bring up so much fear and terror and joy and um, it, it, it was profound. Um, now I want to quickly show the opposite end of scale because this is an artist who's dealing with the same kind of interest in terms of immersion 
Uh, I have a partnership now with an organization called Society for Art and Technology in Montreal, and their whole focus is to create immersive technologies, specifically to create works for um, 360 degree um, spaces. They just finished building an enormous dome on top of their building, and all of their work, all of their workshops, all of their tools are designed to working with artists who want to create new work inside that dome. Again, scale. This is a piece by Johnny Ranger called Six Million Antennas. It was performed uh, in the dome uh, a year ago. You can see on the bottom there are people sitting there. Same desire to have people exist inside the image rather than outside. It's also on the ceiling. Um, this is a whole thing about visualization and database. So this is a, a team, Ben Rubin and Mark Hansen. Um, they're very interested in how to give sonic shape to millions and millions of bits of information. Um, um, data usually has been given a kind of visual preference in terms of what's happening. We, get, we, we create pictures of data so we understand. They're really interested in the temporal dimension of following the shifting process of data and, and how that changes. So for example, one of their first projects was um, called Ear to the Ground. Uh, they did with Lucent Technology, which is a big telecommunications industry. And what they attempted to do was create algorithms that would go into the Lucent Technology website and be able to follow and track how many people at any given time were following their website, what they were looking at, how deep they were going into the site, and each one of those parameters had a whole different sound. So if you, if you listen to what was happening on, you, you listen to what's happening on your website, at five in the morning, very faint kinds of things going on. You can hear it, and then as it progresses into the afternoon, you're getting this whole kind of um, computer symphony that they've created. But you can actually listen to all the different tracks and, and, and follow, like, oh, there's 40 people. There's a lot of people. Oh, it's six in the afternoon. They're only going to see the home page. They're not going deeper. Then they took this idea, and they created something called the listening post. The Listening Post has gone on to, to receive a lot of awards, and what they did with this was to actually create software that would go in and track thousands of chat rooms all over the world as you were talking. As people were talking, it was downloading what the content was. Then they would analyze the content for words, clusters, how many people were talking, when the topics were changing, and then they displayed that as it was happening all over the world on hundreds of LED screens, and each of the text was then given um, a sonic manifestation, so also sound, and that would also change dynamically. I am. Sorry I about am the light, you can't see very well, but you get a sense of it. I am from Dell. I am doing fine. I am fully awake, sir. So these are whole musical My compositions that are being created in real time based on data that's coming I'm in from all over the world. I'm comfortable with my assertions. 
My man east side. I'm the white lighter. I am stumpy. <laughs> and then each time it's different because you have new data, so it would be different each time. I am a professional healer. But they put into the computer that they want everything to start with I am, I'm so hungry. they can program. They they create the, the structure. I am not repeating. Um, and then I paired them and I commissioned elevator repair service, which I think it's come here. No? They, they, well, not to fuse box. But, okay. So, they did. So their whole interest is in the novel and staging novels in very interesting ways. So they're very interested in the book as an interface and text and literature um, in a more conventional way. And I was interested in seeing how two different groups of people, one who in invested at a kind of an older literature but creating really interesting work with um, people who are really interested in the new status of text. Text writing, reading, all has a very different kind of status now that we have mobile and texting and it's a whole different way of understanding language. What kind of um, confluence, what kind of, as Ron says, you know, collusion, collision, um, would happen. So here's a little bit about their work. So you just get a sense of their style. Sometimes they stage the entire novel, which could be seven hours. They usually Faulkner, Hemingway, and Fitzgerald. Those are the three authors they've been working with for the last five years. Okay. So now in this work, this is the work um, that I commissioned called Shuffle. It was performed in the New York Public Library as a performance installation. Basically what happened is they took all the three novels that they've worked with, put it all in a database, created some very interesting algorithms that looked at sentence structure, grammar, um, ways in which sentences started, etc. And then that, those algorithms went into the database and composed a whole new dramatic text every 20 minutes. And that text was sent to iPhones that were embedded in books. So they actually read from books, but what they were getting is, a, is the iPhone embedded in the book as a kind of teleprompter that they had to improvise every 20 minutes around a new text that was coming in. Not only did they get a new text, but they also had clue, cues where to move in the space. So it's also telling them, now you four of you move to the left, and, and they had different zones in the library. And then a new iteration of this will actually um, start a whole new piece of music. Um, so this is a kind of machinic human kind of exploration and, and a kind of performance of data, if you will. So here's the, the, the kind of public library and then we made this documentary. Uh, it's about three minutes of, of, the, of, of like three minutes of a 20 minute cycle. also had these amazing little teleprompters that they could put their iPhones in that would reflect off of mirrors so they could actually, you know, kind of move these really beautiful apparatuses and read as, as text was coming. And then they had projections of the entire text inside the um, library. Princeton. Through the fence, between the curling flower spaces, I could see them hitting. 
Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you have. The other thing I want to talk about really quick is um, hybrid space. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, this is physical computing. This is all about how do you take um, input from physical objects that you can manipulate and enter into the computer, which then has a response and creates media. And so there's a whole kind of very interesting interaction going on between objects, humans, and then um, output from the computer in relationship to that input. This is a Norwegian group um, that I produced um, last year, and Ron and I are in discussion about how to bring their new work here to Fusebox in 2014. Um, their work is about finding old detritus and crap and wires and lenses and all kinds of old stuff and then putting them together to create their whole their own projection systems that are controlled by hundreds of robots and bicycle wheels here's some of their um, um, projection systems and then they um, manipulate these um, also with their hand to create a whole their, their whole kind of um, world that's that's like um, shadow puppets in a way digital shadow puppets if you will and then they come up with the most beautiful, sumptuous images um, that are really um, handmade, if you will. These are just old um, tubes from discarded um, amplifiers that they turn into these little um, objects that they create just phenomenal um, kinds of uh, imagery from. I'll just give you a, a, like a two minute excerpt. So all these wheels, each one of these um, um, objects is connected to a robot, which is then connected to um, um, sensors and computers, which are then generating this sound. They also use old film strips that they kind of put through and then filter through these lenses that they manipulate. And then everything is done with bicycle wheels. They control the whole show um, with the speed. They can change the speed of the show and they can go backwards and they can stop. And all of this is connected to sensors. And I think the last um, thing that I want to talk about is a group that I've been working with called Workspace Unlimited. They're a Belgian-Canadian um, collective. And this is about hybrid space. And let me just try to give you the setup here. You walk into a museum in the lower space, and you're confronted by a screen that's probably larger than this. It doesn't look as large, but it's larger than this. And there are projectors on either side of the screen. So you've got a front projector and a back projector. 
what the artists have done is used gaming technology and 3D graphical worlds to create an exact replica of the museum from very particular vantage points. And that virtual world exists on the computer. And how many of you have played computer games? So you know what avatars are? Avatar is what you mobilize and manipulate inside those worlds. All right. So they've created a replica of particular views inside this virtual museum, which exists in the computer, and there are avatars in there. Then in the real space, <laughs> there are 10 or so um, infrared body tracking. And the virtual world they've created in the computer is matched one-to-one -one with the real physical space. And your body is mapped exactly to an avatar in the virtual space. As you move in the space, that avatar is moving in the virtual space and is accessing totally different views from the museum that are then projected into this physical space. So you're in one part of the museum as you move, you're accessing virtual replicas of different parts of that museum. Okay, so now you've got physical space and virtual space that are mapped on top of each other and are interacting with each other. Then you've got 3D video, which is capturing live and broadcasting you walking in the space inside that, this world. And as you move, you get access to different viewpoints, some of which are simulated, some of which are real, and it's all in 3D. So you wear 3D glasses, and so you have this screen that's just popping out inside, suspended in the room. So here's the person, and as you walk around to the other side of the screen, the entire space is being deconstructed as you move. And so as you move both left and right, you are changing the views and you are simultaneously in three or four different planes, including the video of yourself, which is now inside that space. There you can see, this is the actual space with the curtains. And, but that's actually simulated so you don't know if it's simulated or it's real. And then the person in the back is actually her also being filmed in 3D. So you can see that. And then this is a little bit of what it looks like. And, and then I'm finished here. Remember, this is popping out. So it's suspended as if it's real. And as you walk, things just completely deconstruct. So there's a little screen hanging inside of another screen that's in another space and playing simultaneously with 3D virtual real time and physical space all together at the same time for the aesthetic enjoyment and complete disorientation, which is such a joy. So this is actually the lobby of the museum, but you're in the basement of the museum. This is a project, again, that um, Ron and I are talking about bringing from France called, um, the, the group is called Comedie de Caen. We want to do a piece called Don't Mess with Texas. It actually takes place in, uh, with a true historical event of a group of radical utopian thinkers who came to Texas to start a whole new community and all the political struggles of what it means to create a utopia. And the idea is, um, 
is to think about this historical moment, because Europe has a huge fascination with looking at America as a place for anything. And is that changing? <laughs> is America still a site of utopic possibility? Um, and so it's somewhat of an in investigation of, of those tensions. Um, simultaneously is about um, this historical thing that actually happened with um, their present day journey to Texas, which they've already made, and they've created this documentation. And it's a story about two, this French director and musician traveling in contemporary Texas, juxtaposed to this historical event, um, and, and trying to understand um, the failure of utopia and what the possibilities are. What we're going to do is commission a graphical novel and we're going to turn that novel into a series of live animation in which the actors can gesture and they're tracked very detailly face and body to actually mobilize these characters. This is involving computer vision, which is what I was telling you about. The scientists that we're working with have developed a, a software in which I can video Ron's face Awesome. Take Ron's face, run it through the software, and the computer understands and sees the difference between Ron's eyes, nose, mouth, cheeks, can analyze the movement of what he's doing and how he's speaking, his teeth, his cheeks, his tongues, turn that into a series of instructions, and use those instructions to drive any image. We hope to work with Charles Burns, who's a pretty well-known um, graphic novelist, but we don't have that commitment yet. And what I want to show you now is um, a drawing of an artist that I worked with, just to, to show you an example. This is by Ralph Lemon, who's a choreographer. Ralph made a series of um, African-American famous figures. This is um, Baldwin, James Baldwin. What I did was go online, download James Baldwin's lectures from the 1960s in Berkeley, give it to this woman who lip synced with that sound clip while we videoed her face, took her face, ran it through the software, and her gestures are driving this image with James Baldwin's voice that I downloaded from the internet. So there's all kinds of possibilities to play with gender and history and image to create some very interesting um, animation work. <laughs> I recognize that landscape, the interior and the exterior landscape, the um, tortured and noble and suffering and um, loving mm -hmm. illuminate for me the people all around me. It involves another sense, more difficult to, um, to articulate. And that, but that sense is something you do with the presence of Africa even though it's a very unreadable presence, it's a real one. Real in a way it was not for me when I was young, or, or even as it was not real, let's say, 20, 15, 20 years ago. Something is happening in the Western world. Everybody, in one way or another, feels this. In short, the center, the, um, what was it, presumed to be the center of the Earth, has shifted and the definition of man shifted with it. So you can see what we can do is in real time. So as the um, actors are, are acting, it's actually, um, the computer is actually seeing and calculating all these things, generating it, and then mobilizing these um, to create a kind of um, tension between animated character and real life. Great. Um, so, um, we just want to uh, very quickly uh, go through some of the, 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 the thinking and, and the goals that we're uh, imagining for this uh, art and technology platform. Uh, and, and then we want to open it up to a few questions and then we'll, uh, 
call, call it a day for this session. Um, I'll uh, just sort of very briefly read you our uh, initial, uh, initial stab at our mission statement and then just kind of quickly go through some, some goals. So um, over the next three years, Fusebox will become a strategic and active participant in the local, national, and global production, presentation, and dissemination of new ideas experiences and art relating to and informed by emerging and ubiquitous technologies. This new prog programmatic focus will expand Fusebox's mission of helping to engage both new and repeat audiences with issues and questions that, that define contemporary life. Fusebox will critically deploy research and advanced technologies to deepen and further its position as a catalyst for creating dialogue between disparate economies forms of knowledge, institutions, cultures, and artistic forms. Um, and this will also enhance its core values of education, conversation, artistic support, innovation, and collaboration. So that's sort of the general uh, mission, uh, some language small, that we're throwing that way. Small, but accomplishable. Um, so, um, doable, doable. We, sh we should have this in place by uh, end of this month. And we can, um, um, that's sort of a joke, but uh, that was a this joke. is going to be a three, three multi-year project that we're uh, embarking on. Um, so the way we're thinking about this, there's kind of uh, five different uh, tracks or prongs that we're exploring. And the first of which is, uh, is involves collaboration, and we're interested in forging some strategic uh, alliances, both uh, locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, we're also, um, track number two would be a presentation and innovation track. And we're really interested in uh, presenting fully realized works that are living in this intersection and doing some really interesting things. Um, I also think that we're, we're specifically interested in uh, the Spanish-speaking diaspora. Um, I think we've been thinking about where Austin is located, and uh, there's also a lot of really exciting, amazing work that's happening in Latin America as well as in, in Spain. And we were thinking this could really, in many ways, become a catalyst, uh, a home to present a lot of these ideas and thinking and projects that are taking place. Yeah, th there's an extraordinary amount of energy being um, done in, in, in Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, um, Spain. Um, and our feeling is that Austin and, contigu and contiguous areas in, in, in the Southwest, as well as New York, because clearly the demographics are changing, need to think of itself as part of that diaspora and not outside of that diaspora. Mm -hmm. And the whole art and technology um, um, arena is a place, at least artistically, um, there are other ways to do it, that we can actually access some of the really interesting political and economic and artistic um, discussions that are happening through the lens of those technologies and the kind of projects that are happening through performance, through exhibition, through knowledge. Um, uh, and I think we've talked about the importance of starting, and I know you may be doing this now, I've already done this. Um, translating everything into multiple languages. Um, we've begun um, translating all of our materials into Spanish. I know Ron and I have talked about, you know, yeah, we're, we're working thinking on about how to do that because it's not, um, it's a costly thing to do. It's not just the text, it's also all the metadata and all the ways that people mm -hmm. do searches uh, for things mm -hmm. that also has to be translated. But for me and Future Perfect, that is probably up there. Um, a, as a, a priority to start creating and accessing um, different kinds of languages. Um, and then sort of uh, lastly, uh, uh, we're interested in, in creating a, a generative component. Uh, we like this idea that we're not just presenting works, but we're also uh, creating a space, not necessarily a literal space, but a, a figurative space for uh, ideas to be explored. Uh, and this could be on a very small, intimate level. Maybe, maybe these ideas or uh, creations are, are taking place over 48 hours. Maybe these 
uh, creations are being explored over two, two, three, four years. Um, but we like this idea that this platform can also be a container for exploration and it's generating ideas. And making. And making things. Making, that, yeah. that's, that's paramount, um, I, I think. And, and, and in how we coordinate our efforts to, to make those things happen, I think is gonna be um, looked at very carefully in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's generally it. Just kind of wanted to, uh, I think, uh, ignite some <coughs> thinking around this and get people excited uh, about some of the possibilities, uh, provide some context for the type of work that, are, that is happening. I mean, there's, I mean it's, it's really infinite, but there's, there's, there are some uh, specific sort of areas of investigation that are really pronounced that we're excited by. Um, We'll keep everyone posted. Uh, this is, like I said, we're really just beginning this process. Um, we couldn't be more excited. Uh, I would like to, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if anyone has any comments or thoughts. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have a, we'll get all of your, anyone that, that would like to be specifically updated about this, we can create a list right, uh, right here before you leave. But we'll also be, if you're on the Fusebox mailing list, we'll keep uh, everyone on our mailing list uh, abreast of any new developments with, with this. You can also um, email me at wayne at wayneashley.net. And, and then I had my, my um, this is my, because I'm going to be listing um, things that we're doing together on my website mm -hmm. as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be multiple places um, that I just, I just shut that down. Um, it's um, futureperfectproductions.org. You know, images, uh, a lot of writing, um, uh, sometimes we've created some virtual experience, you know, where we've actually mapped out some of the things in virtual, like as a virtual model that you could actually look through and, and get a sense of it. Um, but yeah, th that's the limit. That's why you want to come. That's why it's important to be present in a work and not rely on its documentation. I mean, we try to be as clear as we can in, in textual kinds of, is that what you mean? In terms of people that don't have access to it or? So here's my here. So so this is something a little bit <laughs> about me. Um, I'm not afraid of costly things, and um, when <laughs> something is really, really, <laughs> and when something is really important, and you get the right people behind it, and it's something that we say yes, we need to bring this. And so, who do you know? How do we get? What are the grants available? And then you start like. Because Ron and I are talking about this very thing. Um, I understand, you know, part of me likes small scale, and I'm excited by the kind of intimacy of that. But I also know that the tools are available to make such damn compelling work right now. And it's also not to say that larger is bigger either, but um, I find ways to tour this stuff. And for example, I I'm working with um, um, the number of governments who really want, who, who, who believe this is a valuable project, this is a valuable art, and want to help tour. Um, we get together a consortium of 
12 venues that also want to bring this together. So there's all kinds of um, models that are already in place that um, um, can manage to bring um, more expensive kinds of work. But that's, m m that's what I want to do. I, I would like us to be able to figure out how to do, doesn't, totally. you know, why should we not? <laughs> I, here, here. Yeah, thank you all. Uh, I think that's it for this talk. Uh, freshen up, get some water, clear your heads. Uh, text your loved ones and uh, come back uh, in just a few few minutes. Uh, we're going to begin round two, which is going to be awesome. Thank you. Johnny, hi. Nice to meet you. Oh, good. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I will, for sure. And it is
myself an error by my lover It's how you go down to the men's room sink It's how we talk of how my men think I see myself an error by my lover I don't know if I'm another miss I don't know you from another See me run, now you're gone Dream on
Waffle, waffle, art, waffle, art. Check. Hello, one, two, three. Check, check. Boom, one, two, three. Check, waffle. Waffle, check. Hello, hello. All right. Well, I guess I'll actually be more like this. I'm going to keep it cash. Yeah. One, two, three. Check. Hello, hello. One, two. That's good. like it's loud Uh, okay. All right. Uh, good after. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it too loud? Too. It's all right. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Andy Horowitz, and I'm the founder and uh, one of the editors of CultureBot.org, which is a website devoted to contemporary performance, arts, culture. Uh, we launched in December 2003. As, a, uh, as an initiative of Performance Space 122 in New York. And, uh, and we've been going, we moved away from them in 2007 uh, or 2006. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so that's what we do. Um, and I want to thank Ron Barry for uh, inviting us down to Austin. Uh, we've been wanting to come down to Fusebox for a long time. And so we're really psyched to be here. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've been doing a lot over the past uh, 
eight months or so has been starting to do sort of uh, live discussions um, and uh, actually we've been calling them, um, we did some stuff in January and then we just recently actually did a week-long residency at Exit Art Gallery in New York. Um, so if you guys actually like, what we've done these before and people afterwards have come up to me and sort of um, complained about the presentational aesthetics of the sort of presenter, observer dynamics. So if you want to move, that's okay. Or if you want to just visualize being in a circle and you know, remove the sort of hierarchical structure of this in your mind, I encourage you to do that. Because um, we're really, what we're really trying to do is sort of figure out how we can, you know, uh, you know, those of you who are here for Wayne's um, presentation, um, and as we talk about the work of the artists at this table, know that artists are really not only doing hybrid technology, but really sort of messing with and, um, you know, blurring the boundaries between disciplines, between audiences, participants, engagement, all these sorts of issues. And so it's like, how do we develop ways of conversation and sort of dramaturgy, if you will, but also audience dialogue that reflects the nature of the work. Um, so this is, um, this, this panel, this discussion uh, was called uh, Performance in Context, or is called Performance in Context, uh, with the subhead, the white, the black box and the white cube. But um, over the time since we initially sort of came up with that and as the panel came together, um, and I looked at also the, the, the program that Ron put together, I feel like that's only one piece of the conversation. I think that uh, it really became evident looking at the, the work of the artists that are gathered here today that um, context is one piece of it, but also there's this sort of idea about practice um, and how what artists, how artists do what they do challenges or relates to this idea of context. So, the, you know, um, I was talking to them, so we're gonna, sort of start with, um, so let me introduce everybody and then we're gonna start talking about sort of the work that people make and then how that butts up against the issues of sort of how we interpret that work based on context. Um, just, uh, yeah, so on my immediate, um, well, uh, one quick other thing. The reason that, I, that I'm saying that is that, you know, part of this conversation started uh, in New York um, there's this big festival called Performa that Rosalie Goldberg organizes, and it's a festival of visual art performance. And then that sort of butted up immediately, that ended, and then immediately came, in New York we have January, we have like theater festival season, where you have Under the Radar Festival, and you have uh, Coil Festival, and you have all these different festivals that are much more situated in theater, or are called theater, but as someone who goes to both, the question, it was like I was seeing all this work, you know, or the work that like, you know, Wayne was talking about with ERS and Ben Rubin, um, that to me looked, was better than what was, or not better, but it was different than what was being in Performa, and you had this sort of like different valuative frameworks. So it's like, so that really became a big, that became a big thing in New York, a big challenge of sort of negotiating why does you know something that happens in one place get looked at one way, and something that happens in a in a in a visual art setting get looked at another way? So, uh, so but that's but that seems less critical at this moment here in Austin. So I wanted to sort of talk about the artists that we have here, and you know, and use that as a way to open up into that. So on my immediate right is Phil Soltanoff. Uh, he's a theater artist. Uh, creating innovative hybrid work in which the arts collide in compelling ways, and he has a show running in the festival right now um, called "An Evening with An Evening with William Shatner Asterisk," and it's at the Salvage Vanguard. Um, to his right is Hillary Graves. Hillary is the director of the Laura Reynolds Gallery. For the past eight years, she was located in Los Angeles as the director at The Box, a gallery that pays particular attention to performance art. Um, and she has curated um, an exhibition called This Is It, With It As It Is. Um, at the Laura Reynolds Gallery, uh, which is part of this festival and has performances uh, today. 
Yeah, we have two perform we have two performances today at the gallery at seven o'clock. Okay, um, and after uh, to her right is Wura Natasha Ogunji. Um, who is a visual artist and performer. Um, her work includes videos in which she engages her body in explorations of movement and mark making across water, land, and air. Um, she's based here and um, has a paragraph full of wonderful credits that um, we will get online. So you can go check them out afterwards because it's too much to read here. And then finally, um, on the right, um, on the far right, is Michael Smith. Um, he is based here in um, Austin and in Brooklyn. Um, he has ex exhibited extensively around the US, Canada, and Europe at a variety of venues from museums and galleries to nightclubs and television. His works are in the permanent collections of the Walker Art Center, the Museum of Modern Art, the Centre Georges Pompidou and the Museum of Radio and Television in New York City. Um, and he has had recent solo exhibitions at Dun & Brown Contemporary in Dallas, Galleria Emmy Fontana in Milan, and at Ellen de, I don't know how to say that, Brun? Brown, Brown uh, and at projects in Amsterdam. Um, so uh, we're, I'm really grateful to all of you for making the time to be here and braving this heat. For me, it's kind of incredibly hot. <laughs> um, so I guess we'll just, why don't we start with, with Michael, since he's sort of the most great. Hi. <laughs> uh, I knew there was one. Um, so I guess I'll start off by talking about, uh, well, there's no camera. So um, talking about um, my work, my process. I come out of a painting background, but uh, that was many years ago. I eventually dried up, not out of uh, renunciation of painting, but just I just ran out of ideas. And I backed into this performance art area. Uh, it was like in the mid-70s, early 70s, and it was, uh, I also was working on my social life, so there were people in that arena, you know, out there in that context. Um, <clears throat> and uh, eventually I started uh, performing. Uh, my work uh, attempts to deal with humor. It seems to be an ongoing uh, st strategy or an ongoing part of my work. Uh, and I'm a reactive sort of artist, uh, whether it's reacting to like uh, social situations that are going on, uh, avant-garde tropes and tendencies and strategies, or you know, just people, my neighbors. It's like I'm reactive. It's mostly I don't really know uh, uh, what I'm doing most of the time, um, but I I know what I I don't know what I want, but. Uh, I, I know what I don't want. So things have to be presented to me and which I, I can react to. Um, as Andy mentioned, I've worked in a variety of contexts and I also work under deadline. And fortunately now I have deadlines. Uh, and I have varying, de varying recipe, I have, uh, uh, my recipe changes according to the, the situation. Uh, the only constant ingredient seems to be panic, degrees of panic. And uh, ideally, I, I, I come from a visual art background. I like to work with drawings, sort of sitting at my table and um, drawing and waiting for something to come, waiting for the muses. Sometimes I work with themes. Sometimes I work with ideas that I get from poor hearing or inability to draw these drawings or in response to like an irritating phone call. Uh, and then I layer these things. I make lists and then maybe a, a deadline comes up and I have to order them and then I have to put them together. Uh, a lot of my work comes out of Variety, or um, when I first started working, I I, I was kind of reacting against the kind of endurance 
work, that kind of slow, sometimes uh, excruciatingly long and boring performances. And I ended up at a comedy club and I became fascinated with these stand-ups working. And then they also, writing is one of my most difficult things to do, even though I can do it. Uh, putting together two thoughts, and the stand-up posed this idea of the non sequitur. So you can jump, and jump, and jump, and go back and forth. Uh, and so I, that sort of became not so much a model, but an inspiration, something to work with. And I've developed two personas. Um, uh, people say to me, oh, you talk about your characters, I have two. One talks, the other one doesn't. And uh, one has been is a sort of 18-month-old toddler, and uh, uh, he hasn't really developed in the last 35 years. And the other one is this Mike. He's kind of bland man, and every man who's sort of, but that every man idea has been thrown up in the air. But he's still. I think of him as kind of a Candide character, and he's in all these adventures various series, a series of adventures that I call them. Not much happens, and a lot of uninflected delivery. Uh, as I look around, and there's a lot of uninflected delivery, now I wonder if I'm getting bored by that. So I just do, I do that. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mura? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm a visual and performance artist, and um, one of the questions we were asked is to talk about the context of our work, how we decide context, and how context informs our work, and, um, and the move between disciplines, if we think of ourselves as artists that work in very specific disciplines. So, um, for me, I, I started uh, as a photographer making work in the world, and it's really a place that informs a lot of my work. It informs my visual work, and it informs my performance, it informs the videos that I make. And that comes from uh, a deep interest in my own, the stories that are invoked by my own body. Um, when I started studying photography, I was very, um, I noted this absence of people of color in histories of photography. And I was really interested in finding ways to photographically invoke those stories and to create photographs of people who either didn't have photographs or people who existed before photography. Because I knew that I had had um, you know, that I have a history, that I have ancestors, and these people existed even if there wasn't some physical documentation of them. And so, uh, through that process, I begin to make photographs of myself, and these stories begin to come to me of various people. And so, I think a lot about the context, uh, the primary context of my work as being the body, and the images that come from my body, the stories that are um, invoked from the body, and so um, the ritual of performance became a way to create the document, the, the physical photograph, the image, the video, the archive. And the archive, the, the creation of um, something that will last, um, is very integral to the work I make. And um, even though a lot of the the actions that I do are um, maybe considered ephemeral or you know, performances don't necessarily last that long. The audience can remember certain parts, but I'm very interested in what that archive looks like. Uh, along with that, the context of the Atlantic Ocean is, is critical to, as a critical place. Um, as uh, thinking about the history of black people in America, and then also my relationship to Africa, which is, um, you know, I have family from Nigeria, but I didn't grow up in Nigeria. So I was always interested in the Atlantic as the space of creativity and as this holder of knowledge. And because of that, place was something that really had to 
that I had to create from stories that came to me. And so when I think about uh, questions of uh, genre or, or the, the gallery versus the theater, I'm, it's an interesting question, but I feel like it doesn't exactly address the way I or many people um, create work. For me, the work is the image comes and then the context arises out of that. And many times the place is not only, uh, so the image comes out of the body, but I feel like the place is drawn to the place where I am. So for example, if I want to talk about an ancestor in Nigeria and I'm here in Austin, there's a way through creativity that I can physically bring that person that person into the room. And so the place becomes, Nigeria uh, has, a, has a space here um, and vice versa. I can go there um, via the creation of a video or I can physically attempt to f fly there, um, et cetera. So I'm really interested in how these narratives of Disconnection require that we invoke spaces that aren't necessarily um, around us, and that the narrative itself determines the context. And we don't necessarily have to um, be in a specific context, but there, the context will come, and the, the history will, will surface no matter where we are. And so, uh, so the work that I make can happen in the theater, it can happen um, you know, on the street, it can happen in another country, um, and the thing that connects all that is my body, and that, that, that doesn't seem uh, at all disjunctive, the move from one place to another. It's rather what comes, what the story requires of me as an artist. Great, can, Hillary, can we do fill yeah, up the, absolutely. okay, great. Um, hi, <clears throat> my name is Phil. Um, I started in traditional theater, uh, and a series of questions um, came out of working uh, in traditional theater, and I've been following those questions ever since. Uh, my real interest I think if you need to boil something down to one thing is a space, meaning I, I take a, a space as the subject and then work out from there. So uh, in the case of uh, Plan B, for instance, the subject was the plane. So the uh, design of the uh, piece became a, a, a moving wall that could be moved from 30 degrees to 45 to 90 to fall over and become a floor and everything became about what could we do with that. So um, work starts somewhere as we all do, but it doesn't necessarily end there. And so uh, uh, I, I try to work um, with a starting point that I like and see where it takes me. So the performance is not known ahead of time. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have a complete faith in my ability to um, organize materials so that in the hour to, uh, well, I, I do believe most performances in my case should happen within an hour, that people aren't wasting their time watching it. And that's all I'll say. Okay. <laughs> all right, Hillary, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, actually, actually, I want to follow up with some questions with the artists and then we'll talk about sort of the content